Now, just because we have different temperaments doesn't mean that one is right and another is wrong. Characteristics about lions, they're very intuitive. They instantly size up the situation. The otter's motto is this, life should be fun. His favorite saying is, lighten up, don't be so serious. Trust me, it'll work out. <laughs> How many have ever heard that before? Trust me. <laughs> I found the temperament study actually to minister a whole lot to me and it's in the Bible not expressly but it's all throughout the Bible we find it in the character of all of the various biblical characters that we study and so after you learn the temperaments then what you can do is as you read through the Bible you can try to figure out what type of temperament or personality each of the people had. So anyway, let's begin by talking about our spiritual gifts. And understanding our spiritual gifts begins with knowing our temperament. Many times we want to talk about the manifestations of the Spirit recorded in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 11. You know, and unto one he gave the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and as Pentecostals, we really like teaching all that stuff. We want to start there. But that's not really the place to start when we're talking about spiritual gifts. What we need to do is start with these creation gifts where we understand how it is that God actually made us in the beginning when we were born in the natural. So when we're talking about the temperaments, we're talking about something that God gave you in your natural birth. Now it's enhanced in your spiritual birth, but he gave it to us first when we were born as a human being uh, into this world. So who we are is the workmanship of God. The Bible tells us that we are the workmanship of God and that we are the workmanship of God both in our natural birth and in our spiritual rebirth. Both are creative acts of God. And so we are exactly who God created us to be, and how many know God don't make no junk? Amen. I learned that from the bumper sticker. It wasn't in the Bible, but I, but I learned that. God don't make no junk, and he doesn't make mistakes. And so sometimes we wonder about, why am I the way I am? You know, maybe God made a mistake, or maybe I'm all messed up. And sometimes we have these feelings about who we are. We're not sure why we are the way we are, or what the value is in being the way that we are. And sometimes we disparage ourselves, but that comes because we do not fully understand the way that God made us. And I believe that after this week, tonight, and next week, you'll have a much better grasp of who you are. Now, what happens is when we are born again, how many know when Jesus Christ comes into our heart, he changes some things? And so we might think that he might change our natural temperament. No, he does not change our natural temperament. He restores it, he enhances it, and he balances it out. And so that's what happens when Jesus comes into our heart. So you might ask, what is a temperament? And this is, a temperament is a basic personality type. They were first identified by a Greek physician and philosopher named Hippocrates, a Greek guy. And he gave Greek names, hard to pronounce Greek names to the four temperaments. He called them choleric, sanguine, phlegmatic, and melancholy. And if I started using all those terms, pretty soon we would be so confused because these are unfamiliar type of words. So for that reason, what I've chosen to do is to use the animal names for the same temperaments. If you, uh, those of you who have taken temperament tests before, perhaps you've done it at work, maybe you have taken the DISC test, the D-I-S-C test, or maybe you've taken some other temperament test, and it helps your boss identify who you are, helps you identify who your boss is, and if you become a student of these things, you learn how to give the boss what he wants based on the kind of temperament that he is. And so if he's a bottom line guy, you don't give him all the details, you don't tell him a lot of stories, you know, you don't uh, get, uh, talk about how you had compassion on somebody. You just go to him and you say, it's going to cost X. It's going to cost us 
$2,000 to do this. And that's what he wants to know. He doesn't want the details. He just needs to make a decision based on the cost. So a lot of these tests are out in the corporate world. And what we're going to do is give you a similar test, but we're just going to use the animal names. You can translate between all those other tests and what we're going to do here tonight and at the end of this class, about quarter to eight, I'm going to hand out a temperament test for those of you who have never taken it and those of you uh, who have taken it before, I suggest you take it again and just find out, you know, if you're, you're, you're probably going to come out just about where you were before because our temperaments really don't change a lot. They may balance out, but they don't really change. So where do the temperaments come from? Well, that's a good question. But all of us are made in the image of God. So it's in the image of God that all personality temperaments come from. When you understand all four temperaments, you can read the Bible and you can realize that God exhibits all four characteristics, all four temperaments. Jesus, I believe, operated equally in all four of the temperaments. At different times in his ministry, you see him acting like a lion, Sometimes he's acting like an otter. He's telling stories. He could preach for hours. Sometimes he's very compassionate, like a golden retriever. And then other times he's very detailed and precise and quoting everything correctly from the Old Testament, just like a beaver would. So we can see in Jesus all the four temperaments, but they're balanced out. They're balanced perfectly in the personality of God, and we get all these things in the image of God. So that's where they all come from. I believe the four temperaments are distributed equally in mankind. We don't have 50% lions, we have 25% lions, 25% otters, 25% beavers, and 25% golden retrievers. I can't prove that, but that's my estimate. And every time we've taught the class and we've had people stand up based on what they thought they were, it was like equal amounts of every single one. So it, just based on some, you know, kind of rough rule of thumb uh, empirical data that I've had just teaching this class, I believe these gifts are distributed equally throughout the human race. Now, God gave you your temperament for a reason. And the reason he gave you this temperament is, if we were all one temperament, if we were all lions, it would be like a pasture full of bulls. There would be nothing but head banging going on all the time. So God has given us different temperaments so that we can work together with one another. Each temperament is a gift from God to the human race, and it allows us to work together because we're all different, but we all add something. We all bring something to the equation. Now, just because we have different temperaments doesn't mean that one is right and another is wrong. And this is how, you know, we, we get when we only know ourselves and we only recognize what we are, we sometimes overlook the fact that if we, if everybody was the same, that um, we would have problems in this life, but we're not all the same. And there's a reason for that. And we have to accept and respect each other for the temperament that God has given each of us. There is no right temperament. There is no wrong temperament where we have all received the same gift from God. And so what we must do is learn to enjoy who God made us to be. Uh, there's a great evangelist, uh, Joyce Meyer, and the name of her program is enjoying everyday life. We need to enjoy, and I've heard her say, we need to enjoy that unique person that God made us to be. We need to enjoy who we are. And that's harder for some of us than it is for others. But it's very, very important that we learn to accept ourselves just the way God made us and enjoy who we are, even though we're different. Even if we wish we were more like somebody else, God has made us the way we are for a purpose. And so we need to learn to accept that and enjoy that. Our temperaments really matter in marriage. And that's why we frequently do this in marriage seminars, because it's very important for each spouse to understand what the, other, what the temperament of the other spouse is. Otherwise, we keep thinking they're doing all this stuff to annoy us. 
because they're different than we are. And the little things that may be part of their temperament, if we don't realize that's the way God made them to be and they're not going to change, if we don't realize that, we're always trying to change them. And you cannot change a person's basic temperament. They are the way that God made them to be. And we cannot change each other in these aspects. We have to learn to accept and recognize what the value is in each of the various temperaments. And I don't have to tell you that when each partner has strengths that the other partner doesn't have, that means that when the two of you come together in marriage, you are stronger as a result because you have more strengths. Does that make sense to everybody? So the two are actually better than one, and what, what happens is you come together as a marriage team and you can do more things and accomplish more in life if you stay in prayer. And husbands, it says, you likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife. Men, we need understanding about how God made our wives. Now, you may not understand her completely, but let's start by understanding what her temperament is, and that will give you some clues and some insights. You may never understand everything about her and why she does what she does, but... Um, this is a, a good place to begin. So, how many temperaments are there? We've kind of covered that. There's four. And let me say this, no one's personality is made up purely of one temperament. We're all a blend. We have a dominant temperament that we're strongest in, and we're blended with a secondary temperament, and maybe even with a third temperament. So we're all a temperament blend. That's what makes us all unique. So, what are the names of the four temperaments? Well, number one, we'll start with the lion. How many have heard of the lion? Amen. Okay, the big roaring lion. The uh, Hippocrates called this personality type choleric. And another word for it in the, in the disc test is dominant. So, the lion is the choleric or the dominant person. The otter is also called sanguine or the influencer in the disc test. The golden retriever is called the phlegmatic in the Greek, or the steady in the disc test. And the beaver is called the melancholy, or the conscientious in the disc test. So these are four different names for these four different temperaments. And whatever test you may take in the corporate world, if it has four temperaments, it's going to have these four, even though it may call it by a whole lot of other different names. Uh, most of which confuse me. So I like to stay with the simple names, the animal names, which are self-evident. So, which temperaments are the extroverts and which are the introverts? Well, the extroverts that are, tend to be uh, socially outgoing are the lions and the otters. Lions and otters tend to be extroverts. And the introverts tend to be the golden retrievers and the beavers. They're quieter and shyer. Now, there are some uh, beavers and golden retrievers that are kind of on the edge and they're fairly outgoing and yet they have their shy moments and uh, vice versa. There's otters and lions that sometimes are, uh, they might be a quiet lion. Uh, I haven't heard of a quiet otter yet. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Otters are known as the talkers in the temperament world. But anyway, we have extroverts and introverts, and what we're going to do is this week, as, as far as we can get, we're going to talk about the extroverts, starting with the lion. And so let's go to our overview of the four temperaments, and we'll talk about the great roaring lion. So the lion has a motto. A lion is not a person that loves to sit around and talk. The lion is a do-something person. So the lion's motto is, let's do something. Let's not sit here, let's do something. Let's not talk about it, let's get up and do it. So his favorite saying is, let's do it my way, now. <laughs> Maybe you've met a lion. Yeah, They're known as the doer, they're extroverts, and they're optimists. They always think, we're, we're going to win this game, we're going to conquer, we're going to make it through. A one-word description for... The lion temperament is powerful. They are powerful, strong temperament uh, individuals. Now here are some lion characteristics. They are natural take charge leaders. How many have ever met that person? Yes. Yeah, okay. They're goal-oriented, goal-oriented, vision-driven, 
decisive, bottom line people. They make a decision fast. They don't need to think about it. They don't need to pray about it most of the time. Uh, they will just make a decision, shoot from the hip, and most of the time they're right. They're doers. They're impact players in sports. They're people that come on the field and they expect to change the game because they came on the field. Seriously, they're not watchers, they're not listeners, they hate being on the bench, they want to be in the game, they want to make something happen. That's really the, what the line is all about, let's make something happen, let's have an impact on our generation. Let's just not sit here and go to the grave having done nothing, let's accomplish something. Even if we set really high goals and only accomplish half of it, let's get something done, let's just not sit around and do nothing. That's, that's what the lion is. He's that kind of person. They're also driven to correct wrongs. If they see a wrong, they'll start a crusade to correct something. They will take charge. In fact, they will correct you if you're out of place. If your um, collar is turned under something, they might just reach up and straighten your collar without asking you. You know, because they're just kind of driven to correct things that are not right. And so... Uh, they're more interested in achieving goals than pleasing people. Kind of like the Apostle Paul, right? He said, you know, um, I'm not here to please people. I'm here to preach the gospel. So, now, there, there is, because they're not people pleasers, and because lions are aggressive, sometimes, after a lion has gone through, there's a, a whole bunch of dead bodies left behind. And those... <laughs> Those are the people that didn't move quick enough and they kind of got pushed out of the way because an aggressive, kind of out of balance, out of control lion, he's going to make something happen and he's, not, he's just not wired to be compassionate about people's feelings. He's moving forward. So that's what he's going to do. He's going to move forward and get something done. And, you know, if you don't want to be a part of what he's doing, just step aside. Just get out of the way and let him go forward. Now... Here's a second batch of characteristics about lions. They're very intuitive. They instantly size up the situation. They instantly know what to do when they come into a situation. They love the challenges when there is maybe an emergency or something and their brains just go lightning fast and they figure out, okay, we'll do this, 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 and this. And they instantly can tell people what to do. You do this, you do this, you do the other thing. They're great to have in a situation of an emergency because they can make fast decisions, shoot from the hip, and most of the time be right. In fact, if you ask a lion, they're always right. <laughs> Have a very hard time admitting that they ever made a mistake. So they will make quick decisions with or without the facts, but most of the time they are right because they do it intuitively. It's a gift they have. Lions prefer short communication with few details. Just get to the bottom line. Spare me the details. They're highly competitive. They thrive on opposition. They love sports, athletics, challenges. Uh, strong lions become apostolic leaders. They love the opposition. They love to go places where no one's ever preached the gospel before. They love to start from scratch. They are the people who can start churches and businesses and, and uh, all kinds of uh, organization from nothing. They just go, they show up, and they begin. And they get it done. And they persevere. And when someone tells them they can't do it, they said, oh, hallelujah. Because all that does, that's like throwing gasoline on a fire, you know. All that does is stir them up where they want to I'm going to prove to that person that I can do this. They thrive on opposition. If you want a lion to succeed, just tell him he can't do it. You're sorry, but you hate to tell him, but you just don't think he can do it. You know what? He will prove you wrong every time. <laughs> Amen. Lions are very pragmatic in general. They dislike theory, concepts, and speculation. Let's not talk about it. Let's not theorize about it. Let's not draw flow charts about it. Let's get out there and do it. They don't want to go through all the, the mental stuff. Let's just do it. Lions' favorite channels on television are going to be, they love the History Channel. They love the Discovery Channel. Anything that's true. Anything that's real. They don't want fiction. They don't want science fiction. They don't want soap operas. You know. 
They want the real stuff. They want to see real people making real decisions, wielding power and influence. That's what lions are all about. They have influence detectors. If you come into a lion's sphere of operation, he has an influence detector, and he will detect you whether you are trying to gain influence on his turf or not. They're very turf-oriented, unless they get, you know, balanced out uh, to a certain degree. But they will detect what other people are doing. They will detect if other people are gaining influence or power in a given organization. They will know instantly who the other influencers are in the organization. If a lion goes into a new organization, he will immediately identify who the power players are in that uh, power scheme of how that organization works. And lions kind of thrive on that, and then they'll see if they feel like they're called to do more, then they'll see if they can't acquire more power and influence so that they can influence that organization to go in a stronger direction than what it's going. So they love leadership stuff. They love uh, things uh, about strong leaders. Okay, lion weaknesses. Well, lions do have some weaknesses. Number one, they're workaholics. They care more about their work. They care more about achieving goals than probably anything else in life. Number two, they're control freaks. They've got to be in control. Sometimes they have to be in control of everything. Lions can be terrible micromanagers. They don't have to be, but sometimes they are. Lions are uh, manipulators. They will manipulate you to do what they want you to do. And most of the time, you will not know that you've been schmoozed into doing um, what they want you to do. Because the goal is important, and they understand people so well that they know what pushes people's buttons. They'll figure it out, and they'll push your buttons to get you to help them accomplish their goal. They're often too hard on people. If people do not um, commit to the project and are not sold out, I mean, they can be hard on people. They also are often viewed as insensitive. And that's because they're not focused on people's feelings, they're focused on the goal. And this is important. Somebody has to be focused on the goal and not on all the little interpersonal relationships that are going on in the organization. So the lions, they're the people that are looking like, where are we going? And all this other little stuff going on down here is wasting our time and wasting our energy, so we need to cut that stuff out and get moving. So they'll tell you to forget your feelings and get the job done. You know, because that's what's important to the lion doesn't care how you feel about it, just do it. Because that's the way he operates. And they do hate to admit being wrong. So, how do we balance, how does Christ balance out the lion? If you're born as a, if you have a lion baby, that little lion baby in the crib is going to be figuring out, he's going to be watching every one of you and detecting weakness and figuring out how he can control the household from the crib. <laughs> if that means throwing a temper tantrum, if that means... Uh, manipulating people and playing power games, you know, throwing fits right at the appropriate moment where you have to give in to him because there's company there or somebody else. Lions are power players. They will find a way to make it their way, that everything is done their way. And so as parents, we have to be wiser than that and just, you know, let them throw their fit or whatever it is and just send them to the room till they realize, hey, that didn't work. If you do that repeatedly, they figured out that didn't work. That didn't get me what I wanted, and I have to change my behavior in order to get what I want. So, how do you balance out the lion? Suppose you came out of the crib as a lion, how do you get balanced out? Well, when Jesus comes into our heart, he begins to balance us out. And when we're born again, some of the bad stuff drops off, the tough stuff drops off. And we begin to develop Christ's love and compassion for people. See, all of us, it doesn't matter what, your, what our temperaments are, we're all called to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, aren't we? Lions are called to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. So that's what lions need to do, is to develop the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness. People will follow a compassionate lion to the end of the earth because he's a strong leader, knows where he's going, and he'll bring you along with him if he's a compassionate leader. Lions also need to learn to wait on the Lord. 
to let the Spirit lead them to get God's timing on things. The lion may intuitively know where he's going, but he doesn't always intuitively know the timing. And that's the hard thing. You may have the vision, but we also have to have the timing to begin to implement the vision. So that's something all of us, I don't care if you're a lion or a golden retriever, we need to learn to wait on the Lord and let the Holy Spirit lead us and get his timing on things. And lions also need to learn to do things in Christ's ability, not in their own ability. Every lion has a lot of ability. They're very able people. They will get stuff done. They will get more stuff done than anyone else. But lions have to learn not to do it in their own strength, to do it in Christ's strength to do it in Christ's way. Just getting the goal accomplished, that's not the way it works. You have to get the goal accomplished without leaving a trail of dead bodies behind. We have to bring people along with us as leaders. And lions need to learn to rest and relax and not be workaholics. If we don't rest and relax, we'll never hear from the Lord the way we need to. So we have to learn to to settle down and relax and hear from Jesus and get the vision, but do it in his timing. So what is the lion's gift to humanity? Well, it's leading and motivating people to accomplish goals. If we didn't have 25% of the world being lions, nothing would be getting done. The otters would be sitting around telling stories. The golden retrievers would be just being very peaceful and and everything stay the same because that's the way they like it without changing anything. The beavers would be over in their corner doing their whatever it is they're into at the moment and they wouldn't be bothering anyone else. They'll be over in the corner thinking and analyzing and, and planning something out in great detail, but they won't be out doing anything. So the lion's gift is to motivate people to work together to accomplish goals. So God's message to us through the lion is let's get something done while we're here. Let's make a difference, have an impact. Imagine how this works in the church. Let's get something done for Jesus while we're here. Let's make a difference for Jesus. Let's have an impact, a positive, Christ-centered impact on this world. Does that make sense to you guys about the lion? Amen. Okay, let's talk about the otter. Now, the otter is... You know, an otter is a playful creature. If you've ever gone to a zoo or seen uh, river otters in the wild, they are constantly playing, it seems like, all day long. I mean, you'll, uh, if you go to the otter pen and the otters are out in the zoo, I mean, there will be a crowd of people just standing around laughing because they're, they're jumping in and out of the water. They're playing with each other. They're tumbling around. Two of them will just be tumbling, tumbling around each other, swimming and playing and just having a, a good old time. And so the otter is a very, very playful creature. The otter's motto is this, life should be fun. <laughs> His favorite saying is, lighten up, don't be so serious. Trust me, it'll work out. <laughs> How many have ever heard that before? Trust me, <laughs> yeah, it's going to work out. Lions, or, uh, otters are known as the talker. They're extroverts. And they're optimists. They always think, you know, tomorrow's going to be a better day than today. They're very, very optimistic, sometimes over-the-top optimistic. Um, and one word that describes them is popular. Whereas the lion was powerful, the otter is popular because they're so playful and friendly. Some otter characteristics are these. They're very charming. They're friendly. They're excitable. They're impulsive. They're fun-seeking people-loving, schmoozers. They can talk you into doing anything because they make it so much fun. It's just like, uh, was it in the book Huckleberry Finn, was it Huck Finn? He, he charged guys a quarter to come and do his job for him to whitewash the fence. Isn't that how it worked? He talked them into it, told them how much fun it was whitewashing and and I haven't read that in a long time. I may not be getting it quite right. But anyway, he talked people into doing his work for him. He had the gift. Otters can make friends anywhere. They have never met a stranger. You walk into a doctor's office, and if there's an otter sitting there, they'll be talking to you in a couple of minutes. You know, um, if they're in the grocery line behind you, they'll be asking you, oh, I've never seen that brand before. What is that? 
And then, you know, they'll draw you into the conversation because they're just that kind of personality. They're so relational, they just love to talk to people, anybody, everywhere. They love to talk, they will tell stories by the hour. Otters are the best and most wonderful storytellers on the planet. They can just hold you spellbound as they're telling the story. And every time they tell the story, it gets a little bit better than it did last time. <laughs> they love to be the center of attention. They're the life of the party. Otters, ha they love bright colors. They're great on stage. They're wonderful storytellers and entertainers and public speakers. You <laughs> it's always funny to me when I watch some, uh, maybe a TV show, and they have all these otters playing doctors. You know, <laughs> it, it just doesn't fit. The personalities do not fit, but they're such great entertainers. You would not want a beaver playing the doctor, which they do in real life, but you don't want them on television because they'd be very boring, drab characters. They would not, it would not come across as something you would want to watch. You know? So anyway, that, that always fascinates me is to see the miscasting of temperaments, but occasionally, in some shows, you see actually the character and the temperament of the actor seem to line up. Or the actor is so good at playing different temperaments, they can actually act like the person that they're supposed to be in a way that's actually convincing. But I don't see that very often. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes I'm just scratching my head like, are you trying to make that look real or what, you know? Do you ever talk to the TV? Yeah. I do. I was like, Writers, producers, why did you do that? You know, geez. So anyway, I, I, I look at the way they make it. I'm, I'm sorry, I just kind of reverse engineer it sometimes and maybe I shouldn't, but yeah, it's the beaver in me. But anyway, otters are wonderful storytellers. They're great entertainers. They're great preachers, motivational speakers. They're awesome. They are inclined to exaggerate though. <laughs> it's like one lady was saying she went into the house she was uh, visiting at the house of um, a friend of hers who was an otter and the when she walked in the house the lady said all the cats on our street are dying of mange and <laughs> her daughter this lady's daughter was just sitting there rolling her eyes at her mother saying yeah the neighbor's cat has mange <laughs> But when the otter tells it, every cat on the street has it. You know, they're dying. It, it's just, they make it a wonderful story. Oh my God, this one street is hit by mange, you know. <laughs> Listen to me, I'll tell you all about it. You know, and it was only one cat. Yeah, Brother Sell. That's, That's evangelistically speaking. <laughs> if an otter preacher tells you how many people were in attendance on Sunday, he was, he was counting the people and... And maybe he counted some of them twice, and there's a couple of flies on the wall, and a, and a service dog that came in, and some kids that ran in and out during the service, and he's counted all of them, you know. <laughs> so they'll add at least 50% to the number, to the real number. Now, for the rest of us, for beavers, we think that's lying. Oh my God, why are they lying about the people? There was, you know, there was 113 people there, not 200. <laughs> Can't they count? You know. <laughs> Because beavers think that's just outright lying, you know, when somebody exaggerates. No, it's not true. I read that same article in the paper and it said 50, not 85, you know. <laughs> so anyways, some of us, you know, do not like the exaggeration stuff, but some of us love to exaggerate. Just, well, it's kind of fun to exaggerate. You know, it, 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 it adds color to the story, doesn't it? All fishermen and hunters. All fishermen and hunters. <laughs> How big was the fish? It was this big. <laughs> yeah, it's bigger every time, you know. When, um, yeah, and especially older guys, when they start talking about their um, prowess in high school athletics, <laughs> every year they have a birthday, you know, they ran faster and they tackled harder and they hit the ball further out of the ballpark, you know. So anyway, if you're an otter, you know you have a little bit of a tendency to exaggerate, but it's all, it's all in good fun, right? We're just trying to uh, entertain people. So some other otter characteristics. Otters are very curious, very curious. 
If you wrap up, if you have an otter in the house and you wrap the Christmas present, the otter will go under the tree when you're not there. Pick it up, weigh it, shake it. If they're really curious, they'll very carefully unwrap it, see what it is, and then wrap it back up again where you do not know that they peaked. Because they're, they're very, very curious. They just love to find out, what is it? What is it? They're spontaneous, they're creative, they're enthusiastic. If you're throwing a party, make sure you invite at least two really well-known otters to come to the party so that you have a good time. Everybody has a good time. Don't sit them by each other because they'll be telling each other stories all night. Put them at opposite ends of the room so they'll be entertaining everybody and the party will be a great success because you had a couple real storytellers and live wires in your room. In fact, in some places, you can even hire people to come in who are, you know, like bona fide otters, and they actually will liven up your dinner party. You know, amen. Sounds like a, sounds like a great job, doesn't it? Yeah. Get paid for just telling stories that you're going to tell anyway. Yeah. So they love to talk, to be the center of attention. I've already said all that. Okay. Uh, let me get down on the right slide here. They are great salesmen. If you go down to the car lot, the chances are you're talking to an otter. I mean, if you listen to their sales pitch about that car, that car never gets stuck in the snow or in the mud. I heard a guy say one time, salesman told him, no, this car is so light, even if it snows, it goes on top of the snow. <laughs> he believed that until it snowed. And he realized, you know, this car needs change just like every other chain in the any ever any other car in the snow. Um, they're great salesmen, they're great networkers. They know people who know people who know people, but if you ask them what the people's names are, they can't quite remember. Because um, they haven't paid attention strongly enough. Otters are strongly influenced by their environment. They're very susceptible to peer pressure. They want to be popular. Um, they forgive people quickly. They want to stay on very relational terms with everybody. And so they uh, want to be accepted, but they're very susceptible to peer pressure. Now, one characteristic of otters, one way you can know for sure you are talking to a bona fide otter, when they talk to you, they will grab your sleeve <laughs> or grab your coat. <laughs> that, now, if you're a beaver or one of the introverted types, if somebody comes up to you, they, first of all, they've gotten within three feet of you. They've, they've exceeded the space limit. <laughs> you know, they've invaded your space and you're starting to feel uncomfortable. And then they reach out and they grab you by the sleeve and you're thinking, oh my God, what's going on? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, but just realize they're an otter. That's what they do. They're so relational, they want to make contact. And if you look away from them, they'll grab you, tug your sleeve. I was just talking to an otter not too long ago, and every time I quit making direct eye contact with them, they would move their hand or do something to draw my eye right back to them. You know, because otters just have this innate sense of wanting to be the center of attention. And they want your ultimate focus. So they want your undivided attention. So, it's a fun thing being around otters. Okay, otter weaknesses. They have a lack of organization and discipline. They can be impulsive and very excitable. They'll get really excited very, very quickly. They're great starters. They want to get on board with every new thing, but they tend to be very poor finishers. Now, if, the, if an otter says, I will make the coffee for such and such an event, uh, they may come, they actually may put the coffee in the pot, but make sure they've plugged it in because they probably got so busy talking to someone, the coffee pot never got plugged in or something happened along those lines. Otters are great starters, they're poor finishers, and they tend to talk too much. And because otters talk too much, they're actually insensitive to other people because they're so uh, occupied with telling their story that they're not paying attention to what other people are doing. And if an otter is trying to tell you a story but you have other uh, things on your mind, you're going to be sitting there, your eyes are glazing over trying to be polite while they're telling you 
the story and you know you really need to get on with what you need to get on with, but the otter does not notice the fact that you're looking away, you're backing up, you know, you're trying to move to what you need to do. They're not taking the subtle hints you're dropping because they just keep on telling their story. So in that sense, otters are insensitive. Even though they care about people, they sometimes don't notice what's really going on. Um, otters tend to avoid the fine print. Oh, the idea is great. Oh, you mean I had to do this? I had to do that? Um, okay. So they tend to avoid the fine print. Frequently, they forget details. Uh, an otter lady shopper, she'll park her car. She is so excited about going to the mall. She will park her car, and when she comes out, she will have no idea where the car is. <laughs> Florence Littower in her book tells the story. She parked her car in a seven-story parking structure, went into the mall for several hours, came out, and had no clue where she parked her car. And so she does her otter thing. Oh, poor distressed female. She's looking around and uh, some guy comes up and says, oh, uh, what's going on? Could I help you? Well, I don't know where I parked my car. And he's looking at her like, you don't know where you parked your car? And then he asked her, well, what kind of car is it? I don't know. <laughs> she said, we have two cars. Well, which one did you drive? I don't remember. <laughs> So the guy says, after a minute, he says, well, do you have your car keys? And maybe we can figure it out from your car keys. So she didn't know where her keys were, and so she had to dump her purse out on the curb to, you know, to pick through it to find the car keys. And then it, by the time it was over, she had several people walking all seven stories of this parking garage. They were having a great time. They were acting like they'd known each other all their lives, and they finally found which car she drove, one of the two cars, up on a certain floor. And everybody had a great time, and she thought it was wonderful. When she got home and told her husband, he's like, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> so anyway, otters tend to forget the details. They always... Um, need something new in their life. They like change. They like changing jobs. They like moving from one house to another. They like moving to a new community. Otters like change. And they tend to form many, um, many relationships, but frequently shallow friendships. And finally, they're quickly attracted to members of the opposite sex. So that's something because of that impulsive excitability. They're so relational that that's also, that's a weakness and they have to watch that. If you're an otter, you need to watch that and learn to recognize those warning signs in yourself when you're being attracted to somebody. So what is the otter's gift? Or how do we balance out the otter? I'm going to kind of speed through this and maybe we'll pick up here uh, next week. But otters have to force themselves to get organized. I just talked to an otter a few days ago, and he was saying his dad was the best thing that ever happened to him. He said he had, been, he had the otter temperament all his life, but his dad forced him to be organized, to write things down, to keep a schedule, to get a day timer, and to do those things. And he said, it's the best thing that ever happened to me because my dad has helped me be successful. Otters must learn to discipline themselves to follow through what they start. Because once the new wears off, it's easy to say, oh, I just don't want to do this anymore. No, you started it, you need to finish it. And so that's an important thing for otters to be successful in life. They have to learn not only getting started at a good speed, but how to follow through. Florence Littower, who wrote the book Personality Plus, is an otter. And this is what she said. This was her rule of thumb. She said, I had to train myself to talk about half as much as I did before. She said, I couldn't set a percentage goal for myself like 37% less because I'm an otter. I don't know what 37% is, but I do have a handle on 50%. I can try to figure out if I don't tell every other story, I'll have talked half as much. And so what she did was she allowed, she learned to allow other people to talk and to enter into the conversation. And she began to learn people's names and to become more sensitive to what's going on in other people, learning to listen more. And so that's very important for otters to do. And in that way, they become more sensitive 
to other people and other people's needs. Otters need to develop the spiritual fruit of self-control and contentment. Jesus said we can be content with such things as we have. These are gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us. And then otters need to work on developing lasting friendships. Next week we'll talk about a temperament that they're still friends with the people they were friends with in second grade. Because they're just, they make those kind of friends and they keep friends all throughout their lives. So what is the otter's gift? Well, the otter's gift is to make life and work fun. That's the gift. God's message through the otter is enjoy life. A merry heart does good like a medicine. Jesse Duplantis has that otter gift of being able to tell stories. And, you know, he makes you laugh, but a merry heart does good like a medicine. In fact, he has like five videos, at least five videos, entitled that, A Merry Heart Does Good Like a Medicine. Um, and, you know, it's a blessing, but he's had to get organized. And he and his wife have had to work together to get him organized and disciplined so that they can carry out the ministry that God has given them. So we're going to stop right here on talking about the temperaments. Next week, we'll talk about the golden retriever, the loyal golden retriever. And golden retrievers are great. They're like the golden retriever dog. They'll lick your face. They love you. You know, they'll always be loyal to you, always come to you. They're just wonderful, wonderful people. And then my favorite temperament of all, the beaver. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. 